Thank you so much for today, God, just the opportunity and the blessing that we have to be together. Um, God, that we have this place that you have provided, um, that we are free to gather together today. Uh, we thank you for that opportunity. And, and Father, we just ask you to just help each of us to, to cherish this and, and to use that well. Father, that we would not take advantage uh, or neglect this opportunity that we have, God, to come before you and worship and to open your word. Holy Spirit, I ask you would come and you would just fill this place. Uh, God, you are who we are here for, who we are here to hear from, and who we are here to experience. So we just ask you would just meet each and every single one of us here this morning. Father, we thank you for your son, for the sacrifice that he made that gives us the right permission and access to come before your holy throne. So Father, we just ask that this time that we have together, that you would come, you would use it. God, that you would be honored and glorified by all that is done here today. We ask this in your son's precious holy name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. We stand upon our feet together as we prepare to offer praise.
keep our praise going. Let's just use this morning as an opportunity to, to offer everything we have, to thank the Lord for his goodness, to praise his holiness and to be in his presence this morning. for that love in this room.
must run Cause my shackles have been broken In the name of Jesus I am set free The devil can hold me of the darkness now and I will not walk in fear I will stand firm I will stand firm yeah. alright one more time together we're going to declare that we're going to speak this over fear. We're going to speak this over darkness in the name of Jesus. That the Lord has all the power. And we are his children. We have been claimed. We have been adopted into his family. And we are no longer burdened by fear or by pain. We have been gathered by grace. We have been surrounded by love. Our sorrows have turned to joy. And we are dancing in the presence of the Lord. So all of the Lord's children, let's declare this together, that we are not slaves to fear. And I'm no longer
time together will be worthwhile because you have spoken. Father, all of this I ask in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Mm. So if you know me, you know that I am a Lions fan. <laughs> hey, 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 hang on, hang on. All right. Some of you guys are questioning it. Some of you guys might be excited about it. But uh, I said it, right? Now, if you ask people who are close to me, if you were to ask my wife, if you were to ask our boys, if you were to ask the guys in the fantasy football league that we do here, They might say something crazy like, I'm a Cowboys fan. (laughs) And it's just crazy. Just absolutely crazy. If you had the chance to uh, look at my history on the ESPN app, you may see a lot of articles and highlights about the Dallas Cowboys, but you can't can't pay attention to that. That's not what matters. If I say I'm a Lions fan, it doesn't really matter what's on the ESPN history, right? And if I was given the option of either attending a Cowboys game at home or a Lions game at home, I would probably choose the Cowboys game. But I, I'm a Lions fan. And as a Lions fan who wants everyone else to be a Lions fan, I really just don't understand why no one else listens to me when I say they should be a Lions fan. I spend all day long talking about the Cowboys and then I tell them they should be Lions fans. But no one listens. I'm not actually a Lions fan, as hard as it is most days. And I realize I'm preaching to the choir because I think if there was any two fan bases who could get along, I think it's the Cowboys and the Lions fan base, okay? (laughs) We know what heartbreak feels like, disappointment, game-ending interceptions. We understand it. So as hard as it is many days, most days, to admit it, I am actually... Cowboys fan. And that's evident based on the fact that I talk about the Cowboys often. I spend most Sundays watching at least half of their game (laughs) before turning it off because I'm just so angry. I have Cowboys shirts. I've never been to a Cowboys game, but I would absolutely love to go. Uh, It's just so expensive. Just anyways, side note. According to the general social survey conducted in 2022, the survey said that out of the U.S. population, 68% seldom or never attend church. 68%. 32% attend monthly, and out of that 32, only 18% attend weekly. Now, this is a statistic that has gone in the negative direction from church standpoint by nine points from 2018 to 2022. It's a pretty drastic change, especially considering the period of time that that all envelops. You have the tragedy and the epidemic of COVID-19, the uncertainty and the sudden change, which led to a lot of people coming to faith, but also it apparently led to a lot of people either choosing never to engage or walk away. So we look at these statistics, and year over year, as long as I can remember, church leaders would talk about the decline of the American church, and they talk about how many people are either just choosing not to activate or live in faith than those who are walking away from the faith. And they quote the statistic year after year, how it continues to decline, and, and talking about the need for for church to change, and and, and I agree 100% with that. But there's a pastor by the name of Tom Mercer who I recently heard him give a talk where he reminded a room full of church planters that while 68% of the world might not be attending church, 100% of the U.S. population sees the church every single week. How is that? 
because 100% of the U.S. population comes in contact with Christians every single week. And while they may never darken our doors, they are watching us preach sermons Monday through Friday. In these messages, it's not verses and compelling arguments, but instead it's how we treat, how we engage, how we behave, and what we say. They're watching. They're watching every day, every week, and they're learning. Who is the church? And who is this Jesus? Well, my example this morning is silly and pointless. It's true that for many of us, if we were to just be really, really honest, our lives look a whole lot more like claiming to be a fan of one team and living with an obsession of another. And if people are watching how we live, and if 68% of the world will never attend one of our churches, how important does that make you and I living in the reality of who we say we are? From the very beginning, here at Axiom, what we were dreaming about, what I continually pray for, what I, as, as your pastor, hope we see and what we experience is a church full of believers who live out Monday through fi- Friday fully equipped, fully engaged followers of Christ. That for me, what I want to see, that when we plan and schedule and when we gather together, that all of the messages, all of the, the, the calls, the expectations, everything, that at the end of the day, what I want to be the reality for our church is that hundreds, maybe even thousands of people would come to faith, not because we gathered them in a room, but because they met you. Because they met you and you lived as a believer and showed them who Jesus is. As a result of an encounter with you, they ask questions that let them know the one who gives life. We're in this series we're calling The Living Dead because it's the reality that you and I live in. While there are a lot of people who might be alive, they are dead inside. This is what scripture says. Scripture says that everyone who's apart from Christ is is dead, that the wages of sin, what sin earns, what, what the choices and decisions that we make apart from Christ earn is death. And that for everyone who is apart from him is, is, is doomed and on the path for one destination, and that is eternal separation from the Heavenly Father and from all goodness. But there's also another reality that for everyone who has encountered Christ, whose life's been changed as a result of that encounter, who has surrendered to him as Lord and Savior, we have been crucified that we no longer live, but now Christ lives through us. So we are now dead to ourselves and alive to Christ. This is what Pastor Matt talked about last week. And so here in week three, of the series Living Dead, I'm calling the message The Living Live. I'm not trying to be clever. It's as silly as it sounds. But it's the truth, right? What is it that differentiates someone who is alive and someone who is dead? Life, right? Living people live. They walk, they talk, they breathe, they eat, they sleep. Dead people don't do any of that. And if someone claims to be alive, but they continue just doing what a dead person does, are they really alive? Not. As a result of you and I being changed, as a result of us being indwelt by the Holy Spirit, there are things that you and I are called to do, ways that we are called to live. And there's reason for this. The reason for this is that very statistic 
is that while the majority of the country may never walk through the church doors, they are engaging with the church every single day. And so you and I, as Christians, as Christ followers, as those who say we are disciples, we have a responsibility. So this is what I want us to talk about this morning. I want us to talk about our responsibility that we have, just some examples that we see for how you and I are called to live that's different. That's different than how the world may live. And that what may happen as a result of that difference is that maybe, just maybe, someone would desire to know the hope, the life that you have, that you have found in Christ. Now, for those of you who do know me, or, and for those who don't know me, know that as we engage and we talk through this, that I do not ever in this area or any other area, teach as someone who's got this all figured out. I'm not teaching from a place of I've perfected this and got this down. In fact, most of the time, not most of the time, every single time, as I'm getting ready to teach on Sunday mornings, it's like stuff that comes like, hey, <laughs> you're not doing this. You should be doing this. Calling into me and pointing into me those things that still need to be removed and changed. So I'm not teaching this from a place of I've got this and you guys all need to get there. But instead I'm saying, hey, we as a church, we as Christians, this is where we're at today, but there is something greater. And so it's me saying, hey, church, let's strive for, work for, aim for, that we might be able to experience just a glimpse, just a piece of what God has for the church. That we have a direction, we have a goal, we have an aiming point. Let's set our eyes on the aiming point and let's go there together. So today we're going to be in the book of Titus. In the book of Titus. Titus is uh, one of three books that's called the Pastoral Epistles. It's called a pastoral epistle because 1st, 2nd Timothy, and Titus were written to two pastors, Timothy and Titus. They're written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, they're written to Timothy, who was the pastor of the church in Ephesus, and Titus, who was the pastor of the church in Crete. So they're called pastoral epistles because Paul wrote them to the pastors. They're also called pastoral epistles because it's within these three books that we get the expectations, qualifications for all leadership within the church. It all comes from these three books. Within these three books, you have the qualifications, expectations of leaders, but then you also have expectations for what those leaders are to teach and expect of the church. And so it's the second kind of passage that we're in this morning in Titus chapter three. And this is what Paul says. Paul says, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. So here at the opening of this passage, Paul tells Titus, remind them. He says, remind them. So this is not necessarily anything new. In fact, all that Paul says here in this opening sentence, Paul has said elsewhere in other epistles. He said in other earlier writings that he has given to the church. So it's not necessarily that this is anything new, but it's something that bears, that needs to be reminded. Because the expectations and what is laid out for the church, how you and I are called to live, is something that can fade from focus. As we go through life, it's easy to get distracted and focus on many other things. And so it's something that we need to be reminded for how you and I are called to live. First thing that Paul lays out here is one that I'm sure that there are some in the room, as soon as you read this, your skin crawled. And that's okay, all right? Don't freak out, all right? We're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. The first thing, the first thing he lays out, he says to be submissive to rulers and authorities. Now, there are some in the room that maybe you see this and you look at our climate and where our world is today and, and maybe you don't have a problem with this. And there's some in the room that you look at our world today, the climate today, and you do have a problem with this. And I, I feel that we have to start with, with one thing and, and one thing only. 
scripture is not dictated by culture. It is beyond and above culture. It is beyond and above the day that we are in. Long before this time of period that you and I live in today ever happened, God knew, and under the guide and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God told Paul to write this down. Not just here, but elsewhere. We see Paul elsewhere talk about how we're to respect all authority because all authority comes from God. All authority. This means that everyone who is in power only has power because God has given it to them. That may be uncomfortable. That may be challenging. That may not line up with what we see. But when we come to an instance where something does not line up with what we see or what makes sense, but it's what Scripture says, we always choose Scripture. We always choose Scripture. So I start here by saying this is biblical. This is what we are called to do. We are called to submit to rulers and authorities. Now, it's really, really easy for us to take passages of Scripture out of context, not apply them properly, and make them say whatever the heck we want to say. And in fact, this passage and others like it have been abused all throughout history. Two instances in particular that we can look at in the not-so-distant past is one, World War II. During World War II, within the German state, Nazi Germany used passages such as this in order to require and expect evangelical churches to bow to the Nazi rule and go along with all of the oppressive and terrible, completely demonic stuff that was going on. And some of the churches, unfortunately, well, most of them, obeyed. We see something similar in the United States during the civil rights movement where, where people are, man, like this is just the law and we're called to just obey the law. And as long as it's a law, you're told to obey it. So there are instances where this is abused. So here's what Paul is not saying. Paul is not saying blindly follow all authority and do whatever it is that they tell you to do. It's not what he's saying. Because we're also told in scripture that there is an instance where you and I are told not to follow those who are in authority. And that's any time that what they're instructing or calling us to do is contrary to God's law. We serve God first. We serve the rulers he has placed over us second. But notice the condition is when they call us to do something contrary to scripture, not when they're leading us in a direction we don't like. not when they're leading us in a direction we don't like. Nowhere in Scripture does it say if you, if you don't agree with what they're saying, if you don't agree with what they're doing, then you don't have to listen to them. No, I'm sorry. But as long as they are our ruler and authority and it's not contrary to Scripture, not contrary to God's law and God's command, we are subject to it. Why? Because God has made them our headship. And how is it that you and I can do this and walk through this as Christians in peace even when we don't agree? We're not in control, and neither are they. God is. God is. And we know that at one point in time, no matter how things go, or what happens between now and then, there will be one king who sits on the throne for all of eternity. That is the promise. That is the guarantee. But until that day comes, we have human rulers. And human rulers are flawed, broken, make mistakes. We see this all throughout Scripture. In fact, you've got to think about the context that Paul is writing this in. Paul is writing this at a point in time where Rome is still ruling most of the known world. And what's going to happen within the next decade, decade and a half, is Roman rulership is going to change, and Rome is going to begin persecuting Christians more severe than person, Christians have ever been persecuted in history. God knows that's coming. And he still instructs Paul to put this in the letter. Why? Because there's something that happens when you and I choose to be good citizens even when we don't agree with everything. What's interesting is that Christians who, uh, Tim, who, who Titus is leading were known for their insurrections. They were known for their chaotic, chaotic rebellion against government. They were known as like these hyperactive, really kind of crazy, like throwing their hands up and screaming, yelling at everything that they disagree with. That was their culture, who they were known as. 
So I want you to pause and think for a second because I want to, as I said week one, we want this to be really, really practical. I don't want this to be something that you can theologically debate over and over and over and spend all your time just debating about it and never do it. All right, this is a doing series, not a talking series. I want you to think for a second of a climate that is chaotic, divisive, and hateful. Where if you're not on my side, you're my enemy. If you don't agree with me, I hate you. If you say anything contrary to what I think, you aren't just wrong, but you're the devil. Don't have to think too hard, right? We don't have to really go far back in history. We're there. In in fact, many people say that this is one of the most divisive times in American history where the opposite sides of nearly every topic are so polarized that it seems physically impossible that they would ever agree on anything. Now, I want you to think about that climate. And I want you to think about a group who instead of looking at someone who disagrees with them as the enemy, degrading, devaluing, and speaking hate, They sought common ground. Ways to unite. Instead of buying into what seems to be the tactic of all people in this situation, instead of continuing the narrative of arguing and and continually debating and continuing to devalue, we speak what is true but we respect regardless. That we respect regardless. I want you to think of a world where instead of every single time a Christian is on TV, they're angry and yelling. They were on TV showing respect and kindness. That instead of getting further entrenched in in things that some are biblical and some are not, right? Like there is no such thing as a fully aligned political party. Why? Because none of them are party Jesus. So in one way or another, they're flawed in humanity. For us to respect and honor, not because we agree with everything that they do, but because we have been called to by submitting to God, living in honor of him, in honor of who we are called to be, that we are not called to continue creating chaos, but to seek to bring about peace. To seek to bring about peace. Now, here in the United States, in my opinion, I think that this is honestly a little bit easier than than who he's writing to. Because you and I live in a nation that while we could debate and argue about the state and all that kind of stuff, we're not going to because that's not why we're here. Um, We have the opportunity that as law-abiding citizens, we get to share our convictions. We get to speak our values. We get to advocate for what is valuable and important to us. And we get to seek to elect individuals who are also going to validate, or not validate, who are going to um, continue leading towards those values. That is part of us being good citizens. Part of us being good citizens is engaging in that. That we get to speak what is true, what is right, and stand for those things while still walking within the law and while still respecting those who are in authority. That we can disagree with them and still respect them. We can disagree and we can still follow the law. Did you know that you don't have to like who's president to do the speed limit? The two things are not really connected at all. Did you know that whether or not you like who's in authority, you still have to pay taxes? And we're biblically mandated to? Why does this matter? Because by us submitting surrendering and being respectful even when we don't agree we're different we're different and we live in light of the one who came not to overthrow powers 
but to bring his own kingdom. The last thing I'll say on this is this, and then we're going to move on. And I spent more time here because I understand that for some in the room, man, this is, this is a big one. This is a hard one. This is a challenging one. And so I wanted to spend appropriate time here. But the last one is this. One of the greatest things that you and I could ever do when it comes to those who are in headship or rulership over us is pray. And I ask you a challenging and kind of a little digging question. Do you spend as much time praying for your president as you do debating about his policies? Because if we spend more time arguing about what we like and what we don't like than we do praying for them, I think that we are failing. That we are failing. We don't fight the same way that the world says we have to fight. We fight on our hands and knees, pleading with the one who is actually in control, pleading with the one who can actually bring about change, pleading with the one whose, whose kingdom we are here to represent and bring. First thing he says is just to be submissive to rulers and authorities. This would have made them different than the culture that they were in and the people they were around. Second, he says, be ready for every good work. What I love about this is that this is not a passive thing. He says, do good works. He says, do good all works. But he doesn't just say, hey, if you happen to see them, he doesn't say, if you have time, or if it like just like passes you by a giant sign that says, hey, here's an opportunity to do something good. No, he says, be ready. He says, be ready to do all good works. It's something that requires preparation. For you and I to be available to do good, it requires preparation. It requires spiritual preparation. That we have to pray and ask, Lord, open my eyes that I would see those around me who are in need. Father, that I could see it, that I would be aware of it, that I would notice. I would notice that those who are the outcasts, those who are the ones who are on the side, those who are the ones you are calling me to, to share with, to engage with. God, give me eyes to see them. We have to prepare physically that there will be time in our schedules that if an opportunity for you to help someone in need comes up, you can do it. Why? Because there's room in your schedule. Think about Jesus. Jesus always had time. There's not a single instance that someone comes up to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, I need something. He's like, ah, busy right now. Is that just by accident? No. Notice how Jesus was able to do more with his time than any of us have ever been able to do with our time and that he didn't neglect his personal walk with the Lord but always found time to be alone with God. He always found time to meet the needs that came to him. He always had time to teach and engage with his family and his loved ones. He was intentional. It requires intentionality. We have to prepare physically. Sometimes it's even preparing financially. How, how many of us, if, if we really do believe that part of our responsibility as a church is to be generous, to help those who are, who are in need, how many of us, when we sit down and we make our, our budget each and every single month, are seeking to leave room within our budget for us to help a family who needs groceries bought? It requires preparation. It's not just going to happen. We have to say, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to be people who do good works. We're going to be people who seek to, to live and walk out as we are called. And that requires us to commit to that, put action to it, long before the day of acting upon it ever comes. It requires us to be ready. He says, all good works. All good works. Not just some, but we're called in occasion. All good works. There's opportunities for us to love and engage with those who are in need, but it's also your job to do good work at work. If you're doing the bare minimum, if you're barely scraping by, if you're just doing what you have to, you're not putting in the extra effort, you don't care about your product, you don't care about the company, you don't care about your bosses, you're doing it wrong. Scripture tells us that we are to do all things to the glory of God. I've had this conviction for a really long time, and it comes from a place of growing up in, 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 in the decade whenever the Christian industry started doing everything where we were making movies and TV shows and music, and it was awful. It was just bad. We made bad music. We made bad movies. We made bad TV shows. I don't think that's God-honoring at all. I personally believe that Christians should be some of the best in every field that they're in. Why? Because you're doing it to glorify God and God expects the best. But it doesn't matter what we're doing. 
I don't care if you're sweeping and mopping floors. Those better be the dangest, cleanest floors that have ever been in that building. Why? Because you're not sleeping the floor for your boss. You're sleeping it for God. And because when you do your best, your coworkers will notice. And while they're all sitting in the, in the break room, griping out about boss doing so-and-so and acting such-and-such, you don't have to engage. And when they ask you, dude, why do you care so much? You can tell them. Because there's one who's called me who's higher. It's different. It's different. But we don't do the same thing that everybody else is doing because we're not motivated by the same thing, driven by the same thing, or here for the same purpose. He says, do good works. Third, he says, speak evil of no one. <laughs> no one! Speaking evil is devaluing and degrading. It's not disagreeing. How can we preach that God came for everyone if we devalue some people to be less than human? Those two messages don't walk hand in hand. We can't spit in the face of someone and then reach out a hand and be like, hey, Jesus loves you. It doesn't work. You notice that there's no condition on this. Paul doesn't say, don't speak evil of good people. But evil people, it's okay to speak evil about them. No. Go back to Jesus. Jesus told him, he says, if you only love those who love you, you are no better than the non-believers. Because don't they do that too? If we only love, encourage, care for, and lift up, people we think deserve it or who are like us or think like us or have values like us, we are no better than them. We're no better. We're no different. That's why for so many of us, if our coworkers, those who are close to us, were based on our actions, forced to answer the question, do they represent Jesus well? we probably wouldn't like the answer. Speak evil of no one. For avoid quarreling. Quarreling is arguing just to argue. This is maximizing or making the minimums bigger. It's making a mountain out of a molehill. Boy, oh boy, are we great at this one. We argue about everything, every teeny tiny thing, every small disagreement, any argument that there is out there to have. I guarantee there's someone who's a Christian on one side. Some are important. Some are necessary. And that's not quarreling. But some, honestly, they're just not hills worth dying on. And it would be much better for us just to be like, hey, you know what? Let's just agree we disagree on this issue and move forward. And there is more relationship to be gained through that than ever will be gained through winning the argument. Paul says avoid quarreling. Avoid bickering. Most of the time, people who are known for quarreling, they miss the main thing. It's not that they're really good at arguing small things and big things. It's most of the time they're so distracted or focused on this one small thing that they even miss the main thing. They're hard to be in a relationship with. Why? Because they're always trying to start arguments. If every time you invite someone over to your house, they argue about your decorations, you're gonna, you're gonna invite them over more? Probably not because they missed the entire point of them being there. He says, avoid quarreling. This means both starting it and engaging in it. If there's a person who just wants to argue, some of the best things that we can do in the middle of the conversation is stop and say, hey, what good is gonna come from this conversation? And if neither of you can say something, then maybe you just don't have the conversation. It also means that there are some people who are just gonna argue to argue. And the best thing you could do is just avoid them. There is no reason for you to debate, 
on Facebook. 90% of the people in comments are just there to start stuff. That's it. They don't actually care what you're talking about. They just want to tick you off. So just don't engage. Because it's our witness. It's our witness. We're saying this is who Jesus is. Jesus is one who argues and bickers about everything. And then especially when we see that like within the church body, it's even worse because then we're like, hey, everyone in the world, we want you to come and be part of our community. And then they look at it and they're like, what is better about your community than literally any organization anywhere that I could join? Because it really kind of just looks like you guys just spend all your time arguing and bickering. You're not united. You guys don't really care for each other. So like why join you when I could get the same thing joining my local political rally? We're going to argue just as much as you guys. It's one of the reasons that what we are to be known for is our unity. Because what's common is disunity. What's common is division. What's natural for us as human beings is to argue about everything. Why? Because I'm always right. Since I'm always right, I want you to know I'm always right. Avoid quarreling. Next, he says, be gentle. To be gentle is to be considerate of others, to put their needs above your own. He's not talking about going out into a, in a pasture and picking daisies and holding the daisies oh so gently. He's not talking about walking around with a sheep draped on your shoulders as a loving shepherd. That's not gentle. Gentle is I care about what you need, what you want, how you're feeling. And I'm gonna prioritize your needs, your wants, your feelings above my own. Jesus is known, known as one who is gentle. He's gentle because he sacrificed himself for what you and I need. That's gentleness. Gentleness is I could, I'm physically able of putting myself first, but I choose not to. I choose not to. We must be gentle. To ask the question, are we really looking out for people or are we more focused on ourselves? And this is a hard one. What about how we engage with others makes Christ attractive? What about with how we engage with people makes them be like, hey, this Jesus that you represent, he seems like a good guy. Be gentle. Finally, he says, be perfectly courteous to all people. Again, all people, those we like and those we don't, those we agree with and those we don't. Perfect. Perfect courtesy. Doesn't say good courtesy. He doesn't say great courtesy. He doesn't say Paul's courtesy. He doesn't say, hey, I want you to live with the courtesy that I have for people. He doesn't say, I want you to live with the courtesy that John has or Jose has. He doesn't say, I want you to live with the courtesy that Christian has for people. No, he says perfect. So who is the model? It's not whether or not you're more courteous, more caring, more considerate of others than Jose down the street. It's are you as courteous as Christ? He's the example. He's the standard. Do you and I consider people as much as Christ considers them? When we look at people, do we see them the same way that Christ sees them? Do we show the same care, the same sincerity? Do we welcome them in the same? Do we make time for them? It causes us to be perfectly courteous towards all people. Now at this point, you may be like, Christian, you keep saying people we like and people we don't like. What's the deal? Because well, that's kind of like the main thing. As Christians, you and I were given something we did not deserve. We were given something we didn't earn. And it's because of what we have been given that we are not called to live out of that reality. 
that you and I don't get to treat people based on what they deserve anymore. We don't get to engage in them based on how much we like them or how much we agree. Our standard is different. Is it fair? No, it's not. Is it easy? Heck no. But those are the wrong questions. The right question is, what are we biblically called to do? And this is it. We are called to live in a manner that is honor and worthy to the sacrifice that we have been given. We are called to live in such a way that others might be drawn to him. It's why we're here. He continues in the passage just real quick. Verse three, he says, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Paul says, we, we too, for we ourselves. He's, Paul is speaking about himself. He's sp- speaking about Titus. He's speaking about the Christians. He's speaking about you. He's speaking about me. All of us, we've all been in this place. We've all been separated from Christ. As we talked about in week one, that we've all been starving. We've all chosen to walk away, t- to, to walk away from our Father and try to do things our own way. At the end of that line, at the end of that rope, we had nothing. And now we are starving in need of hope, in need of change, in need of saving. We all start there. We were all once dead. All of us, every single Christian was once dead. That we know what it's like to experience being slaves to various passions and pleasures, things that we thought we were choosing to do and all of a sudden they're choosing us. Things that we no longer have control over, but they have control over us. We know what it's like to live and walk in hate and envy, just simply desiring to have the same thing our neighbor has, but never being able to have it and never having enough. We know what it's like to live and walk in hate, hate for people who don't like you or aren't like you or don't talk like you or act like you, and then you're hated by them just as much. And we know that at the end of that, experiencing and living in that, there is nothing, there is nothing to show, there is only destruction. We were all there. Then he continues in verse four. He says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our savior. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Paul says we were dead, but then we are saved. We are saved not because we earned it, not because we deserved it, not because we were righteous enough, not because we were mostly good, not because we voted for the right person, not because we agree with all the right things, but we are saved because of his loving kindness and his mercy. That's it. And we have been saved. We have been saved by one who then pours out his spirit on us, not sparingly, not just enough, but richly, fully, wholly, completely. He wholly pours his spirit out on us that we might be freed from the things that once held us captive, that we might be able to walk in newness of life, regenerated, buried with him in baptism, raised in newness of life, now to walk an example of who he is in his power, in his might, in his victory. that this is both the reason and the power by which you and I now are called to live. This is why it matters how we live. And this is also the ability by which you and I can live different. I know that there are some times that that changing how you live, changing how you engage, changing what you do can be hard. Most of the time it's hard, but it's not impossible. because the victory has been won because we are now dead to sin and alive to Christ because we are now a new creation this is what motivates us this is by what power we seek to live different and walk and what is hard Titus closes out this section in verse 8 he says the saying is trustworthy And I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. 
but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Paul closes by saying it's true, it's true that all of us, we were once dead, but we are now alive. We are alive only because of the mercy of Christ. Because this is true, Titus insists, don't say, hey, this is one option. Don't say, hey, if you've got time. Don't say, hey, if you really feel like it. No, insist it. Say, church, I insist. We must. It's not an option. This is necessary. It is necessary that we devote ourselves to good works, to be devoted, to be driven by, that this is what our focus is, that decisions that we make, we make based on, is this going to do good works which brings honor and glory to the Father? That for every single Christian in the room, every single Christian on earth, there is one thing that should motivate and drive us forward. And it's are we living in honor and representation for the God who has saved us? That's why we're here. There is no other reason. There is not a single other reason that we are here. Now you might say, but Christian, what about my family and my job? Didn't you say that was important? Aha, here's a really awesome thing. To live in honor of God positively affects every area of your life because living in honor of God means that you are a loving, caring, involved parent who seeks to shepherd and raise your child well in the ways of the Lord that if you raise them well, they will walk all the days of their lives knowing him and walking with him. To be a God-honoring good person means a marriage that doesn't just make it to the end, but is healthy and good and brings good things. That people celebrate you on your 50th wedding anniversary, not just because you were able to stick it out long enough, but because they look at the example of your marriage and say, I want a marriage like that. You guys really love each other. You really encourage each other. You really support each other. You're really in it together and you truly are better together that you work in a way that people say, man, you do good quality work and it's awesome. Every area of our life is positively affected by his living in honor and glory of God. But that's the reason. That's the priority. Jesus in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you are salt you are salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its salty, saltiness, how shall it regain its taste? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown onto, thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. The city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house in the same way. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. Why? Why is this important? And give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, why does it matter that we live lives as those who are living? It's so they can know the goodness of the Father. It's so they can know the goodness of the Father that the 68% that will never walk through the doors of a church, that by an encounter with you, that their lives would be better because they met you. And through you, Christ changed them. Our world is better with Christians who are living as Christians in it. And I truly believe it is how God designed and created the world to be reached. Not necessarily in giant cathedrals, but around kitchen tables. Through those that are in your circle, who are at your workplace, who are in your family, who do not know the Lord, but by you living in a way that is honoring and glorifying to God, by you living in a way that you have been called, they would desire to know why and by what power you're able to do it. And you could simply tell them, I know where you're at. I was there too. And the only reason I'm different is because of the loving kindness and mercy of Christ. and you can get it too.
matters. It matters how we live. And our world needs, it needs us. Your world needs you. The beginning I talked about responsibility, right? We don't get to pass the buck. We don't get to save maybe someone else. It's us. It's you. You are called. You are there for that purpose. You are there for that reason. So can I just encourage and challenge you? Live it out. If you are living, live. Walk as one who is alive. Walk as one who has been changed. Be different than those who are around you. Not because you want to be a weirdo. Right? The whole Jesus freak movement missed the mark just a little bit. Right? The premise and the goal is good. But there should be something different about us. But what's different about us is Christ in us. I'm going to pray. And uh, Brendan and the band are going to lead us in the final song this morning. As they do so, we have community here at the front as well as in the back where you come and take us if you're led. Um, I just encourage you that as you come forward and as you take, Jesus said that every time you take of this bread or drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. That we remember his body that was broken, his blood that was shed. That both as we take, that we remember, we thank him for what he has done. That we come before him right in a correct posture of humility, gratitude. But that we are also reminded and encouraged to live each day, Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday, Saturday, Sunday through Saturday, whatever, every day, in a way that would draw others to the place that they would want to know the one whose body was broken and blood was shed for them. That more people might be brought from death to life. Heavenly Father, I thank you First and foremost, what it is you've done. For your sacrifice that was made. God, I thank you that there's not a point in time that you have ever treated us how we deserve to be treated. But that you were gentle. That you are merciful. days out as we did before we knew you, but Father, we can experience freedom in you, victory in your name. That our lives can be changed, how we live can be different. And it's that way because of your work, because of your spirit. Father, I ask that for each and every single person in the room this morning who is a follower of you, us of the ways that we are not living as representatives of you. You would open our eyes to see the opportunities of good works that are all around us. God, that you would help us to be peacemakers. Father, that you would unite us. Father, that you would help us to care for one another better and to care for those who are around us better. Passion us and embolden us. God, that we would not be content to just 
be Christians in name and in church attendance alone, but Father, in every area of our lives, in every day of our lives, that we would seek to represent you and to live in honor of your sacrifice. Father, I pray for those who are around us. Father, for those who need you. Father, that through our church, through our people, church let's stand up on our feet as we prepare to respond Thank you.